All right, are we ready? Good evening, or I should say good afternoon. It's so rare that we have something earlier in the afternoon rather than evening, but it gives me pleasure to see all of you here tonight. And I know we are Zooming, so welcome to you out in a virtual world. It gives me great pleasure as executive director, I'm Cynthia Shore, um, director of the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association. And every year we have and nominate and select a nationally known and probably internationally known poet to be our poet in residence. And uh, interestingly enough, this year it's uh, Natasha Trethaway, 2022. Welcome, Natasha. And I want to, yes. <laughs> I'd like to share the story that we had originally invited her to come in 2020. And of course, that was the first year of COVID and we were doing our Zoom, but Natasha indicated that she would much rather come in person and couldn't we figure something out? And I said, of course, and certainly coming from afar, it is very important that people wanna be here uh, in their honor. So we had someone else that year who was more local. Actually, I think we did it on Zoom. And Natasha didn't want to do it on Zoom. She wanted to be here in person. So we delayed it until this year. So we are very happy that we can gather with or without masks and uh, want you all to be safe. But again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to welcome Natasha. And I'll introduce Maria Basil. She is our secretary treasurer of our trustees and she will be the moderator for the evening. So thank you, Maria. And now I would like to introduce our board president, Dr. Jack Houlihan, will come up and give you a welcome also. Jack. Okay, well, welcome everybody, uh, including those of you out in video land. Um, I'm not the person you've come here to see or hear, so just let me be brief. Uh, in the name of the board of trustees, of the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association, I want to welcome you. You are sitting on the last, well, the last publicly owned 1.3 acres of Walter Whitman Sr.'s farm, where Walt was born, that's Walter Whitman Jr., was born in 1819 at the end of May. I mean, you might be sitting in the, uh, in the vegetable garden because of course they had the vegetable garden close to the house. Um, and, you know, Walt's father wasn't very good as a farmer. He didn't succeed. And uh, so they moved away. They moved to Brooklyn when he was four years old. But Walt uh, continued to love Long Island and uh, worked here uh, as a school teacher, uh, as an editor. He founded the Long Islander, the uh, Huntington newspaper, which now is still in existence. All these 203, well, 200 and, um, well, he didn't start it when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was about 20 years old. Um, and, and Walt's, one of Walt's themes is the poets to come, poets to come. He, it, 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 uh, it's a phrase that occurs throughout the leaves of grass. And so as the Birthplace Association, uh, one of our main missions is to uh, encourage and foster the poets to come. And we do that in many ways, particularly through our uh, Long Island School Poetry Contest, which uh, the, the winners will be, thousands of students uh, join this contest and the winners will be uh, announced and awarded tomorrow. Um, but the other thing is poets to come from Walt's perspective are the American, the great American poets that have come throughout the 20th and now the 21st century. And so, as Cynthia said, in 1981, we began to bring some of the finest American poets here, proximate to Walt's birthday, as our poets in residence, and 
today's poet, Natasha Trethewey, is one of those poets who's following in the footsteps of people like Allen Ginsberg, um, <laughs> Robert Pinsky, uh, and more uh, Naomi Shihab Nye, and many others. And so let me now introduce or turn the mic over to Maria Basil, who will uh, introduce our program. Thank you, Dr. Coolahan. Um, and uh, so my name is Maria Basil. I'm uh, also on the board of trustees here at the Walt Whitman Birthplace. And I wanted to welcome, um, welcome everybody on Zoom who's joining us virtually and everybody here in the room who has come to um, come to see and meet uh, Natasha Trewithy. Now she, um, it's really, really, you know, whenever I'm, whenever I'm at a loss for words, <laughs> I kind of lean on Walt, right? So um, I'm going to lean on Walt Whitman a little bit. He has a, he has a poem called Song of the Open Road. And at the end of the first part of this song. He says, still here, I carry my old delicious burdens. I carry them, men and women. I carry them with me wherever I go. I swear it is impossible for me to get rid of them. I am filled with them and I will fill them in return. Natasha Trewithy is, as you all know, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. She has served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States from 2012 to 2014. And uh, while she was serving at the same time as the State Poet Laureate of the state of Mississippi, She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Memorial Drive. And I hope she'll be able to read us some excerpts from that. Um, and Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. She has five collections of poetry, including Monument, Poems New and Selected, which was long listed for the 2018 National Book Award, Thrall in 2012, Native Guard 2006, for which she won the Pulitzer Prize. I don't know. Now, Natasha and I just met in person. So I can't really put the date and the moment of when I fell in love with her. Or maybe I can, actually. I think I can. So one of the things that, that Dr. Coolahan didn't mention and that I haven't mentioned about myself is something that he knows and, and the people who know me know is that I love the sound of my own voice. Mm -hmm. And actually, actually, it goes a little bit further than that. I actually love the sound. I love listening to the sound of people's voices. It got me in trouble once. I uh, am a surgeon and there was a patient who was telling me a story of a recent hospitalization for two minutes before I realized he was speaking in Italian. And so that's how much I love hearing people tell their stories, people using their own voices, and I just fall in love. So. Now I can, actually thinking about it, now I can pinpoint the moment that I fell in love with Natasha Trewithy was when I took um, her book, Memorial Drive, and I pressed play for the audio book. Now, you know, those of you who listen to books on tape, books on audio, know that it usually starts out this is Memorial Drive, you know, by Natasha Truity, and sometimes mentions the publisher and, you know, reads the title page. And then she said, this is the author. And I thought, 
oh my goodness, I'm in love. I'm in love. She's going to read this entire book for me. She's going to tell me the story in her own voice. And what a trustworthy voice. What a compassionate voice it turned out to be. Vulnerable, but sensitive, reliable, compassionate, and always, always hopeful. And so I thank you so much for that. And with that, revelation <laughs> and disclosure, I um, present to you our 2022 poet in residence, Natasha Trowick. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. I absolutely had to be here. I, I had to see this birthplace. I, I got to go in and see the room in which Walt Whitman was born. I couldn't have missed that. So thank you for postponing and letting me come when we could travel again. Thank you. So great, thank, thank you again for, uh, for being here and for having, this is not an easy thing to do, a, uh, you know, an in-person hybrid and, you know, and responding to us you know, here in the room and out on Zoom and all types of different you know, uh, ways of technology. And I know in the past two years that you've actually had to deal with, you know, having, having um, these types of conversations on Zoom, like in front of your laptop and, you know, and so it, it does make it, I'm so, so glad to, to have you here. Um, I will ask you about that. Um, actually, that little anecdote that we talked about earlier. What was it like? What is it like to tell your own story? to a room of people, to read your own book? What, was, what went behind the decision of, of narrating uh, your memoir for us? Well, I was really worried about what um, an actor or several actors might do. My publisher would have hired actors, but they gave me the option to read it first. And I really worried about people's preconceived notions and stereotypes about what people sound like, people from certain regions, people of certain races. I, I really worried about that. And even now, as I, as I deal with um, Sony TV, who is going to make the series of Memorial Drive, people keep asking me, well, what did your mother sound like? You know, they want to know what she was like. And I, I was back in Mississippi just last week um, getting to do a reading there and people who had known my mother since she was four years old were in the audience. And later on, I got to ask them. I think I knew the answer, but I, I wanted to ask and hear it and be reminded. What about me reminded them of my mother? And they said, everything, the way you move, your gestures, your voice. So I didn't want someone trying to do some imitation of what they thought a Southern Black woman from Mississippi ought to sound like when this is what she sounds like. Thank you. That yeah. was one of them. And then, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I think also because I am a poet and I am so interested in the precision of language, I really didn't want an imitation of, I want to be real thing. Yeah. Oh, and how authentic, really. I recommend, even if you've read the book, if, or if you haven't read the book, your first experience should be um, hearing the audio book and listening to Natasha tell, tell the story. And, and it, there's nothing like it. It's really quite an experience. Mm -hmm. so, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, but you talked about the precision of poetry and, and the idea that, the idea of authenticity too. Um, and so I, I did notice actually that, that most, you know, you are a poet. And so I would love to know what went into the idea of writing this memoir. As you were, you know, as you were going back into, um, you know, 
why this mem why the story now why is it in this creative nonfiction form mm -hmm. and not in a, you know, in the form of a poem. Mm -hmm. You have, we are right now in between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Mm -hmm. um, you have mm -hmm. some poems, you have many poems about your, um, about your father. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have a few about your mother, but as this story was unfolding for you, why was it important to make it specifically into that form? Well, I needed more room to move around in the prose. One of the things that I think a, a reader who sits with Memorial Drive and sits with Monument, My New and Selected, will notice is that so many of the photographs or scenes um, that I write about in Memorial Drive I have also written about in poems. It just gave me an opportunity to look at something different. Sometimes it's a photograph that I've written about several times. And each time I'm directing your vision to something else. The reason that I had to write the book though, was that in the aftermath of my growing success uh, as a poet, being written about frequently in newspapers and magazines, often my backstory became part of the story that the reporter would mention. And in that backstory, almost as a footnote, was my mother, her death. She was often rendered um, simply as a victim or a murdered woman. And it seemed to me that um, she was being erased and denied the primacy that she had, her role in making me the poet that I am. And I decided if she was going to continue to be mentioned like this, then I was going to be the one to tell her story. Thank you. Thank you for telling that story and thank you for choosing to tell it as a, you know, as a memoir in prose. Um, and, you know, and the poets in the room will understand that, pro that as prose and as a memoir, it will probably reach a lot more people than, uh, than, as, a, um, than as a poem or a different, you know, a different set of people. Um, so thank I you. I still wanted it to be very poetic, of course. I mean, I oh, thought of it right. as yeah. writing uh, a long poem or as the apocryphal story about Robert Frost goes, the 25th poem is what he called the entire collection. So even as I'm writing individual poems or individual sections, I'm thinking about the larger arc of narrative um, in the entire book of poems. And that was easily translatable to writing prose. And because I am interested in the rhythms of syntax, the rhythms of rhetorical movement from one place to another, all of those things that I'm interested in poetry, it was easy to bring those to prose. And I had to think about that musicality. And the only thing I didn't have were line breaks. Now, I, actually, that's very, very interesting that you would, that you would um, describe it that way. Um, because interestingly, um, as you read some of any, not any, but many of the Natasha Triwithy poems that I've read, um, the line breaks are there in a very formal way. Um, but when you read them, they're there to set up the arc of the story. Um, and so, I guess the best way to illustrate that um, would be to take a poem that, that does that, that has a very formal structure, but yet when it's read and when it's, um, when it's read on the page, when it's recited, especially when it's spoken, it comes out uh, telling the story. Mm -hmm. So, um, You've been able to uncover many of the people that you carry with you as, mm -hmm. as Walt Whitman does, um, and particularly examine, I know in 
in different poems your um, your relationship with your father, who um, who we learn later on that you um, that you physically left with your mother uh, when um, when your parents' marriage ended and um, and you moved to Atlanta or to yeah, to Georgia. Um, and so you were nine years old, um, but six, were you six? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you were six years old um, and, uh, and, and started a new life with your mom. Um, and then no doubt have reconnected with your dad or were connected with your dad. Yeah, I saw him time. every summer. Aww. Yeah, I went home to Mississippi and to New Orleans to see my father. Yeah. So there was a poem that I read uh, to my daughter as we were preparing for this conversation. Um, and she, um, she was so impressed by it, actually, that she asked me if it was written in a formal way. Is there a form to that poem? Is it, you know, is it a sonnet? Is it, a, is it something? Is it a poem? Because it was really, to her, it was a story. Mm -hmm. Um, so that poem was Miscegenation, um, and I wonder if you would read that for us. I'd be happy to. So Miscegenation is a puzzle, and that means it's in these closed couplets. And the first couplet is when the writer is supposed to set up the refrain as well as the rhyme. And I set up my refrain, you'll hear my refrain word is Mississippi, but I do something a little different than a traditional huzzle with the rhyme scheme. In a traditional huzzle, the rhyme is supposed to appear just before the refrain word. So if the line were something like, um, I went down and I saw uh, a bed in the river and I thought maybe I should stick my head in the river. So, uh, and there were things that were read in the river. So you hear where the rhyme is, you hear where the refrain is. I don't do that. Listen for the refrain and I, um, for the rhyme and I'll look forward to talking about that afterwards. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. So um, as that first couplet states, um, I was, my parents' marriage was illegal um, when I was born in, 1960, in 1966. They had to leave Mississippi to go out of the state uh, to find a state where it was legal to be married and get married but then it was illegal to return to the state of Mississippi married. So that's the two laws that they broke. Um, that therefore rendering me uh, illegitimate in the eyes of the law, persona non grata. And so um, 
one of the things that a hazel has to do, uh, the, the poet is supposed to invoke her own name in the final couplet. Um, and so you hear this couplet, I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. So there's Joe Christmas uh, from Faulkner's novel, uh, the baby that was left at the doorstep of the orphanage named Joe Christmas because it was Christmas day um, by the janitor. And of course, Christmas child is the Jesus child, um, which is also the meaning of the name Natasha. So all of those things are coming together in the poem, um, this place that has sort of rendered me uh, a complete outsider, um, illegitimate. And so the rhyme, if you heard it, um, are these words here, just two words, name, same, name, name, same, name. So over and over again, I am saying that my name is the same. It is the same name as the Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Incredible, right? I mean, I, I just... <laughs> so Christina, I know you're on Zoom, so that, that's the reason. Yes, it is written in a form. The form is called a huzzle. It's actually also 14 lines, so it almost unofficially, it's also a sonnet. And um, so I, you know, so... That's the answer to your question. And thank you so much for helping me. Help, yes. Helping me. Thank help you, you out there. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, we're having this wonderful conversation and actually uh, the memorial of your, um, that comes up in, in your book, Memorial Drive. Um, that date is also sandwiched in between Mother's Day and Father's Day, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and so I wonder if you would uh, read for us, there are, there are two other poems I know in particular that, um, that do honor your father mm -hmm. um, or explore um, your father, uh, your relationship with your father. And um, as a surgeon who is the son of a surgeon mm -hmm. um, and you, I'm going to use that as a metaphor for mm -hmm. you as a poet, as the daughter of a poet. Mm -hmm. So could you help us uh, unpack some of that and how that comes out in the forms of your poems? Mm -hmm. um, I am also writing a memoir now about my father um, because he also deserves a full length treatment. Um, my book, Thrall, was dedicated to my father and was very much about my relationship with my father. Um, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read a poem um, that is an imitation of a poem of my father's. Um, as Maria mentioned, my father was also a poet. He was one of my first teachers. I was in his class when I went to graduate school. Um, and he has a, a a lovely, lovely poem called Wait. And this is a poem of mine called Reach that imitates that poem, but it also uh, deals with my relationship with my father um, in the last few years of his life. Reach. Right off, I hear him singing, the strings of his old guitar hymning the darkness as before. Late nights on the front porch, the mountains across the valley blurred to outline. We are at it again, father and daughter, deep in our cups, rehearsing the long years between us. In the distance, I hear the foghorn call of bullfrogs, envoys from the river of lamentation my father is determined to cross. Already, I know where this is headed. How many times has the night turned toward regret? My father saying, if only I'd been a better husband, she'd be alive today. Saying, Gwen and I would get back together if she were alive. It's the same old song. He is Orpheus trying to bring her back with the music of his words. 
lines of a poem drifting now into my dreams. Picking the first chords, my father leans into the neck of the guitar, rolls his shoulders until he's lost in it, the song carrying him across the porch and down into the damp grass. Even asleep, I know where he is going. I cannot call him back. Through the valley, the blacktop winds like a river, and he is stepping into it, walking now toward the other side where she waits, my mother, just out of reach. And we very, very much look forward to um, reading more of Thrall. Um, your new and selected has many more um, mm -hmm. that come from uh, that come from Thrall. Um, and uh, I wonder, and, and and very much look forward to a, a full length memoir about your relationship with your dad. So that sounds terrific. Mm -hmm. But let's let's turn a little bit toward uh, Memorial Drive then. Um, the memoir um, that really started to tell the story of, um, of your mom and, and to which you lent your, your voice so, so. Um, and I wanted to, um, I, I wanna set up the next few questions, the next part of the conversation around a haunting, haunting line that you have in the prologue, the very beginning of the book. Um, and so actually, do you have, actually you have a copy, a paper copy of the book. And so Natasha, would you honor us by reading this first um, section? Sure. Of a memorial drive. Thank you. Thanks for letting us part of this. This is the opening to Memorial Drive. Three weeks after my mother is dead, I dream of her. We walk a rutted path, an oval track around which we are making our slow revolution. Side by side, so close our shoulders nearly touch, neither of us speaking, both of us in our traces. Though I know she is dead, I have a sense of contentment as if she's only gone someplace else to which I've journeyed to meet her. The world around us is dim, a backdrop of shadows out of which now a man comes. Even in the dream, I know what he has done. And yet I smile, lifting my hand and speaking a greeting as he passes. It's then that my mother turns to me, then that I see it, a whole, the size of a quarter in the center of her forehead. From it comes a light so bright, so piercing, that I suffer the kind of momentary blindness brought on by staring at the sun, her face nothing but light ringed in darkness when she speaks. Do you know what it means to have a wound that never heals? I know I am not meant to answer, and so we walk on as before, rounding the path until we meet him again. This time, he's come to finish what he started. Holding a gun, he is aiming at her head. This time, I think I can save her. Is it enough to throw myself in the bullet's path, shout, no? I wait to that single word, my own voice wrenching me from sleep. But it's my mother's voice that remains, her last question to me, do you know what it means to have a wound that never heals? A refrain. Thank you. <laughs> we might, you're right, we might need it. Because um, that, that refrain is just, it's just haunting, it's compelling, and it is, and it's going to lead the rest of our conversation. Um, you've actually already covered a lot of it. Do you know what it means? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it means? So how does the poet 
um, take formal forms of poetry, take rhyme schemes and, and different kind of rules that poets uh, use to bring out meaning. Um, and you did that so, you illustrated that so well with the, with the hustle. Um, and so now to the healing part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about whether writing this book and how writing this book helped identify and look at the wound and hopefully is starting to help heal the wound and whether that's an important thing for poets and writers and people to understand about examining your past. So, you know, I, I wanna start by saying something about um, dream theory, you know, I, I don't know what, which one you subscribe to, but the, the idea that um, the dreamer is, is every character in the dream. And so when my mother in the dream says to me, do you know what it means to have a wound that never heals? It is indeed a question that I, the dreamer, am asking of myself at that moment, three weeks after her death. One of the things I talk about later on in the book is that um, the thing that Lorca says in his article about the Duende, he writes, in trying to heal the wound that never heals lies the strangeness. Um, it's one of the things that he believes uh, drives a writer, that, that Duende, that, that wound, that, that awareness of death is indeed the thing that can make a work not simply beautiful, but also haunted. Um, I'm pretty sure, as I say, that I had not read Lorca when I posed that question to myself in a dream at 19. And yet reading it years later, it did help to make sense of what was happening to me at that moment and in the process of writing the book. Now, I also have to mention something that I cleave to all the time, and that is uh, these lines from Rumi, the wound is the place where the light enters you. And for that reason, one would think you'd never want to get rid of a wound because it is the place where the light enters you. Um, and it always reminds me of this beautiful poem called Machiko Dead by Jack Gilbert, in which he describes uh, you know, what it is like uh, after Machiko is dead, uh, his wife. Um, and he likens it to a man who's having to carry a box. And you know how you can hold the box out in front of you for a while until it gets heavy. And then when it's too heavy to hold like that, you put it on one shoulder. And then when that shoulder can't take it anymore, you move it over to the other shoulder. And then after a while by then, he's able to hold it out in front of him again and never have to put it down. Now that's a paraphrase of a poem that is so much better than my paraphrase, but the point is you can hold it and you can never put it down because you never want to put it down. So that connects for me to the roomie. I, I want to keep the wound. Um, and so I think of it, we've discussed this before, um, since you're a surgeon, something, the metaphor for me is about palliative care. Um, when you have a wound that never heals, what you can do is keep it clean. You can uh, make it hurt less. You can expose it to light and make it bearable, something that you'll carry for the rest of your life. Um, that's what I think this is like. Now, I do believe, however, that there is a kind of resilience um, in being able to tell one's own story, that it is crucial to survival to be able to tell a story about, especially about trauma. And so um, that indeed is what I'm able to do. If not heal, 
that wound that I never want to heal nor put down, I can at least find a way to tell the story. Thank you. Thank you for finding that way. And thank you. You know, and, and it is so it is so wonderful that you can continue to share that story as painful as it is, as intimate as it is. Um, and, and ultimately there is a hope that what you do will inspire others to, to be able to look at those wounds and maybe hope ultimately that they are things that they can bear, that they can carry and that they can learn from and share their whole lives mm -hmm. without completely disintegrating, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so- Well, you know, um, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote that poems are records of the best and happiest times and the best and happiest minds. And that poetry is the mirror that makes beautiful that which is distorted. Mm -hmm. So the ability to make something, to, to make one's story, to make a poem, to tell in narrative, the story of the trauma transforms it from something that would otherwise destroy or, or erode you, the kind of despair, and transform it into something beautiful. So there are two more, so there are two interesting parts of two turns that the narrative and that your uh, narrative device takes in Memorial Drive. One of the sections or chapters of the book, you actually write in, um, in second, third, second, second, person. second person. Yes, where you're actually, um, and it's around a certain event in the trajectory of, of um, understanding what the relationship was like between your mother and your stepfather. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you suddenly shift uh, the, um, the person of, uh, of the narrator. So can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Yes, this is a chapter called You Know, and it begins, you remember even though you don't want to. And um, it, it, it ends um, with the lines, look at you. Even now you think you can, distance yourself from that girl you were right in the second person as if you weren't the one to whom any of this happened. So with those two bookends, you know, the, the idea for me was that this, this was perhaps one of the hardest chapters to write because it is a chapter about the first time in the middle of the night, I heard my mother um, being, um, Oh, beaten by her ex-husband, and um, the formal mechanism of that distancing of that um, second person is actually what we think of when we think of the ideal marriage of content and form. Um, the the content is me needing so much to try to forget that and to be distanced from it and, and to have felt divided by that moment of trauma, that divided self um, that the second person actually enacts in form what the content of the chapter is trying to do. Um, when I wrote it, I knew that it was the right formal mechanism because it also, you know, it also conveyed that stated state of mind, that divided state of mind. But I felt that I had written myself into a corner because once you write in the second person, how on earth do you get out of it? <laughs> well, so the chapter immediately following that one is a chapter called Dear Diary. And I begin in that chapter uh, parsing a, 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 a um, what, what is it, a, a, a phrase, uh, to be beside oneself. Um, the idea that we say we are beside oneself when 
um, you know, excitement or, or, or some other powerful emotion renders us kind of that two-ness. Um, so I parse that for a moment um, before I talk about my mother giving me a diary so that um, I'd have a place to, to write down the things that I was witnessing and the things that were uh, dividing me in many ways. And the last line of that chapter is I had begun to compose myself. And so of course that composing is, is writing the self. It's, and it's bringing the self, the divided self back together. It is indeed, I think, the, the moment that I sort of really begin to understand the power of writing to help compose the self, but also to push back uh, against um, the things in the world that might try to otherwise destroy you. That's because my former stepfather um, picks the lock on the diary, I find out, and he's begun to read it. And so whatever I thought I was putting down in private thoughts, at that moment I realized would not be private. And so I decided to start addressing him directly in the diary. And I was pushing back and saying some things, a litany of you know the things he had done, um, using some choice language that I wasn't allowed to say out loud, um, but knowing that he wasn't going to reveal that he was reading it. And so it became this private conversation where I could say anything I wanted to him um, and, and feel power in my ability to do that, to push back. And so in a weird way, I sort of thought of him as becoming my first audience because he was the one reading and he was the one I had to push back against. Wow, wow. very powerful. This and is before I knew what he was capable of, of course, but. Amazing. Um, so the, the, the other term and the other change in voice that, that I wanted to talk about next um, actually had to do with some of the final chapters, but some of the final passages of Memorial Drive are actually taken from court papers mm -hmm. and from your mother's own statements mm -hmm. and testimonies. So they're actually not, it's not your voice in the first person, mm -hmm. it's not your voice in the second person, and it's not even a third person voice. Mm -hmm. It's actually your mother's voice. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and how that got into your book? Well, it was a tough decision because I, on the one hand, worried that people would think of it as me being lazy, not trying to write the story of that, but just actually giving her own words. I worried that um, that's what some readers would think. But what um, was more important to me even than that was, well, the idea of me, the daughter, um, to the extent that um, any child uh, might adore a parent. You know, I, I use the word hagiography in here because, you know, it, it could certainly be a hagiography. Um, it, uh, it is a love letter to my mother. Uh, so perhaps to some people, I might not be the most reliable narrator. If I tell you how wonderful she is, uh, how resilient, how strong, how determined, all of those things, you might or might not believe me. I wanted you to read it in her own words, the incontrovertible truth of who she was in her own words. Um, when you read the transcripts, for example, of phone calls, my mother spent two days um, with a recording device that the assistant, assistant district attorney had attached to her phone so that she could get enough threats of, from him on tape that they would issue an arrest warrant to try to save her life. And so she had these long conversations with him where he was dissembling, spiraling 
you know, saying, giving her what he called a choice, which was no choice, either come back to him or die. And throughout that entire thing, she is determined. She does not say she will go back to him because she is not going to go back to him. She is, even though uh, statistics show in domestic violence cases, your odds of going up, your chances of dying go up not when you stay, but when you leave. And she is determined to, to live her life away from him. Um, she is resolute and, um, but also her patience, um, her strength comes through so powerfully. I, I wanted her voice to be part of this. I think it's also, um, there's other places in the book where I talk about the, my own voice and in the sort of measured restraint of my mother's voice, I, I hear the origins of my own, uh, my own poetic voice. I hear um, in my mother's voice, which is why I use the epigraph from Shakespeare's sonnet number three, thou art thy mother's glass and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. I am indeed um, a mirror of my mother. That very much came out um, in, in this book. Um, and you are indeed a beautiful mirror of your mother. Um, now, I have to say that, you know, that I believe that, again, that it's the poet, you know, is the poet making is it is the poet writing in prose to tell the story um and then using you know using your mother's words from those transcripts is fo actually following a rule an unspoken rule of poets that in general that we never tell mm -hmm. folks when we're trying to mm -hmm. make a poem that we really have to show them. Mm -hmm. So if your if your attempt and your your intent was to to show people who your mother was mm -hmm. and what happened to her, that was absolutely the most poetic and best way mm -hmm. to show people without telling them and having to be the narrator mm -hmm. of of the story. It was to use her own words. Mm -hmm. so, so I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a few more minutes to take some, some um, questions from our grateful audience. Um, and, and again, we have a very um, mixed audience. Some people came in knowing um, your story and, and some of your history, having read this book, having read your poems, um, and some of them have not. Some of them, some of us um, have uh, written poetry and some of us are, um, are fans. Um, so I hope you will have patience with us as we, <laughs> as we kind of bring up some hope. But before we uh, take these next few questions, um, let's please give Natasha a round of applause. Thank you. Already shared. So, do we have some questions from the audience? Hi. Um, pleasure to, to speak with you. Um, I had some questions about uh, some of your earlier works, either, uh, domestic, uh, domestic work in, in Millox, um, uh, or Ophelia. Ophelia, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, so, those are. Uh, mostly taken from photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you choose which poems, or what what inspired you to to use poem? Uh, excuse me, photographs to write those works. Well, I think um, early on, um, when I was becoming a poet, I was drawn to photographs um, as documentary evidence, um, but also because of the of the of the five senses 
the sense of sight is the one that um, is most powerful for me as a, as a writer that I know that if I can't make a picture, make an image of something in my head, then I can't write about it. I, I need to see it. And so it seemed natural to, to begin to try to write about various moments um, by looking at a photograph, describing not only what is there, but then um, going beyond the frame to, to think about what happened just before or after the photograph was taken. I'm also drawn to um, the very elegiac nature of a photograph, that it always represents um, a moment that is no longer and people that are not the same as they were in that moment. You know, I, it's sort of, sort of like um, the way Bob Haas in uh, meditation at Libunitis writes, a uh, word is elegy to the thing it signifies. I mean, already the thing is gone. Um, and I've always thought that there was something very poignant about how when we look at a photograph, we know so much more about what was to come in the lives of the people than they could at that moment. And so it, it's already imbued with all of those things that just focusing on the image and trying to describe it as faithfully as possible will allow the figurative possibilities that are already there to emerge. Wonderful. Very good question. Do we have another? First of all, just thank you for being, being. Um, <laughs> what strikes me um, is the movement that occurs from the vibratory nature of sound, the movement that occurs internally as I read. Mm -hmm. And a phrase, I, I don't understand what you mean, but may or may not. What do you mean by the rhythm of rhetorical movement? Because mm -hmm. I'm very glad you're here live too, because mm -hmm. your presence creates a shape shifting. Mm -hmm. But what do you mean by the rhythm of rhetorical movement? And are you conscious of the changing that is happening as the reader is reading? I'm never the same after I read mm -hmm. something by you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the I wish I could. Um, show you this um, uh, almost a diagram of what I'm trying to talk about, but um, I, I have a poem called Elegy, um, which is an elegy that I wrote um, to my father. Something, it, it was not about his death, but something else that I was um, elegizing in the poem. And it is an imitation. An imitation is my absolute favorite thing, you know, because you know, poems are always in conversation with others. And I don't sit down to write without reading uh, another poet's work um, and, and entering into that conversation. And one of the things that I'm reading for is the, that rhythm of the rhetorical movement. I mean, how a, a poet gets from one place to another. Um, and I could, there, there's so many poems that I could tell you that that I've, that I've engaged with that allowed that. But this was a poem um, by Claudia Emerson called Aftermath that I was reading one day and had to sit down and uh, immediately begin writing elegy because the, the, these moves that she makes throughout the poem, um, I want to try to tell you uh, just with the words without reading the poem, so. Let me get to it. She begins her poem with um, the lines, I think by now it is time for the second cutting, the feel that has lain, whatever, you know. And I begin my poem, I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. So already I'm following her early rhetorical movement. Later on in the poem, uh, she'll say, I, I imagine it. You must remember how. Um, I can tell you now. These sort of rhetorical moves that advance the, 
the movement in the poem, they advance the narrative of the poem. I, in, I feel like I, I allow the, the cadence and the rhythm of that so that when I sit down, my own lines follow that pattern. It, it's, it's pattern, you know? It's just, it's just like um, the pattern in a sonnet. Um, and we know sort of more stricter patterns of form like that. But I think of rhetorical movement like that as also a kind of rhythmic pattern that when I'm reading, I, I, it sort of gets in my head and it, it opens a pathway for whatever it is I'm trying to get out in poem. Does that make any sense? Okay. <laughs> it does. It sounds a lot like what musicians do now with beats, mm -hmm. right? So they take a beat or a rhythm from, from a song from the 70s or from the disco era, and, they, and there's a whole new imagining of that beat into what they want to say. And so I, mean, I love showing um, when I, I, now my students seem to love it, but before, you know, students would think about imitation and think that that was a bad thing, that like that it was copying as opposed to, and I would say to things, to, I would say to them things like, well, you didn't make up the sonnet, but you don't have any problem writing a sonnet, you know? But we're just talking about rhetorical movement. And so um, finally, I, I would show them Claudia Emerson's poem and my poem um, about very different things. And it would take them a while before they realized just how much I was following that rhetorical movement. And so they see that it just unlocks something in you that doesn't make you copy. It just shows you a path through. So I have a, I have a poem that's a real crowd pleaser, it seems to be, but it was, um, it was an imitation mm -hmm. um, of an old nursery rhyme or a book that I used to read to my children. Yeah. And it's called Goodnight Womb. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, um, and so for, and by the time I've finished reading it, it does more than, you know, it's very evident that I didn't copy the poem right. because it's really discussing a completely right. different thing than right. falling asleep at night. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Sorry, this is long enough, but I love you. Um, thank you for being here. Um, pride. Everybody is not watching you. Um, on videos, um, that's here. Um, I think I want, if possible, can you speak more about um, Lorca's In Search of Duende? Um, and if you ever have these moments where you feel like you're, you're straddling your own limits of personal autonomy, the feeling of, yes, I know I'm powerful, but are you ever overcome with this, this feeling that I, I just need to stand up? <laughs> Actually, to give her like maybe five more seconds to answer that, and for the people who are going to be watching this on YouTube later, could you repeat at least the last part of your? into the microphones. <laughs> um, do, you, do you ever feel like you have, you have moments where your, your, your personal autonomy, personal power is feeling challenged and, you, and you're straddling because the content is so weighted, I'm sorry. That's all right. Oh my goodness. That's okay. I just moved. <laughs> no, that's all right. You know, um, that is a that is really a good question. And it I think it kind of has a um, 
the answer is is kind of funny to me in some ways, and that is the the envelope of form, whether it be a poem or the 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 very constructed um, structural movement of the memoir. When I'm talking about form, when I'm talking about the making of the thing, I'm able to talk about it, you know, because it is a made thing. It, it is the thing that is uh, the manifestation of the triumph over whatever the trauma was. Anytime someone asks me about my mother, though, I almost always cry because it, it's not already shaped in language. I haven't already made it a made thing. If I could answer every question by reading a poem I'd already written, this may not happen. Um, but I also, I, I want um, anyone watching, especially people who might struggle with um, grief, um, or some kinds of despair to know that the tears don't always mean sadness. That's not what it is I'm feeling. I mean, I, I feel the loss of my mother. I feel bereft, um, you know, my whole adult life because of having lost her. But when I wrote the book, I got more of her back because things that I had spent years trying to forget that made me forget parts of her too. I got a lot of her back doing that. But I also get to have these moments where people that I had not known before they were in a room with me, at least for a little while, are also thinking about my mother. And that makes me feel that she lives again. If I was talking about the Confederacy, <laughs> Confederate monuments, white supremacy, all that kind of stuff, I would not cry at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and it, it, you know, and it's funny. So I am, I, I am privileged to be exactly thirteen months older than you, and so as your elder, I will say. That, but I also, you know, experienced high school and trauma and cry and people trying to make you cry, trying not to make you cry, and it's just a lifetime of that. And I feel like we've been through that together. Um, um, and so I thank you for making all of us cry and for, <laughs> and for sharing what you have shared with us um, tonight. Do we have another, we have one more question? Oh, okay, so, um, so would you be able to, um, to read it or? Okay, and then, I'm, and then maybe I'll because then, okay. Okay, so the, Dr. Fishbein is, um, Dr. Susan Fishbein is, is a, a seasoned and famous educator in this, uh, in this area. And she's also the vice president of our um, board of Trustees mm -hmm. here at the birthplace. And so her question is about education and about elementary education and the improvement of, um, of how we teach poetry mm -hmm. um, to our, am I getting that right? Uh, to, any suggestions to further um, encourage this, the study of poetry in, in our schools? Well, it's a pretty simple answer, but I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, 
during my uh, second term as poet laureate, um, I went around the country with uh, Jeffrey Brown of the News Hour, uh, PBS News Hour, to do a, a series of um, where poetry lives. And one of the places that we went was uh, an inner city school in Detroit that was um, participating in this uh, citywide poetry program. Now, not all the schools uh, adapted it, but they did. And um, I got to sit down, these were middle school kids, and I got to sit down with three of them and ask them about the role that poetry played in their lives. And uh, there was a girl that I said to, what would you do if you had my job? If you had to go around and um, get people interested in poetry who think that they don't like poetry or that poetry doesn't offer them anything. And she looked at me and she said, well, first I would read them a poem because obviously if they don't like poetry, they don't know what it is. And I think from, that's the right answer. You know, I believe that there is a poem out there for everybody. And, 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 and sometimes when people don't think they like poetry, it's that they've not found the right poem. Um, they've not found the gateway poem because once you find a poem that invites you in, you want more of that. And so I try with my own students to find the poems that speak to each and every one of them so that they become lovers of poetry who will then share that love of poetry with someone else. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your love of poetry with us. And you're right, love is, love is almost always the answer, right? So. Um, so. <laughs> So any other questions for Ms. Troethy before we give her a little break, before we bring her back for her poetry reading this evening? Um, okay, thank you very much. None, I, I, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> oh, you were great. Thank you. 